Hi everyone, this is Ken Master Isaac Steinkant from the Chess Summit Network. I'm back in Richmond and this is my first video since returning home. Um, it's been a little bit hectic this week with moving back into the house and getting ready for my um, tournaments that are coming up, so I haven't been posting as I'd like. Um, but that being said, I've got a video here for today and I hope that you guys enjoy this video about dynamic play in the opening. Uh, and using dynamic play to create a static advantage. So uh, for today's video, I want to bring back a game that I showed on my very first post when I relaunched the website um, from the Washington International. Um, you know, I covered it a little bit there, but it was more of a general kind of uh, analysis. It wasn't really that deep. Um, and today I wanted to specifically to discuss this, this line, uh, or this opening rather, where dynamic play leads to static. Uh, inequalities and eventually a static advantage. And so this is the position, it's round two and I have black against a 2200 rated player. And my opponents exchanged dark squared bishops on h6 and now has a queen on h6. And as we can see in this position, white has a de uh, like a developmental advantage. Um, white has more space, not necessarily a space advantage, but just more space. And he's ready to castle, his pieces have more clear squares. Meanwhile, it's difficult to identify, you know, squares that I can go to. So in this position, you know, I was looking, I was looking for various candidate moves, and it becomes very clear. Like if I make slow, you know, slow moves, then I could very easily get in trouble. For example, if, um, you know, if I start looking at moves like knight on b to d7, I already think that white's a little bit better, mainly because of ideas like playing for e5 and trying to show that the f6 knight is misplaced, or maybe even just g4, g5. Um, this would be interesting, but I think white has a long-term advantage based on how I handle this very position. It's very important to recognize these positions and identify that slow, you know, slow play will not, you know, will not cut it. And so, you know, if you've read Josef Dorfman's book about um, statics and dynamics, one of his rules is about dynamic play is that if you're worth statically, you must find dynamic resources. This is a change in the pawn structure, a change in material. Um, or simply just a combination um, to change the pace of the game. And that's exactly what black needs here. So looking for dynamic moves, obviously there's no way to force like a capture, but I am definitely looking for ways to change um, the overall structure of the game. If I can change the pawn structure in the center and kind of show that like white space is a little bit meaningless, then perhaps I can prove that black has something to fight for in this position. So the first observation I made before even considering options is that without the dark squared bishop, it's actually white who suffers more. Because having played this f3 move in the king's Indian, he's weakened this f2 square and this e3 square. So these three squares right here become a lot weaker without a dark squared bishop. So already, you know, that should get, you know, your mind ticking like, okay, like, um, you know, the, the, the dark squares are very, you know, very weak for, for white here in this position. And so a move like b takes c4, while it does change the structure, it didn't really cross my mind because I'm not really doing anything to challenge the dark squares. Sure, I could have a move like queen to b6, but okay, queen to b, uh, queen to d2, and already my opponent's threatening moves like e5. Um, I don't really like black's position that much anymore because I haven't really identified, you know, what white's challenges need to be. So sometimes it's really important to maintain the tension in the structures while trying to create imbalances in them at the same time. And that's why I played the move that I played in the game, queen to b6. The idea being that queen to b6 attacks this d4 pawn, which is on a dark square, obviously. And should my opponent play knight on g to e2, now it makes a lot more sense to take on take on c4. I just pick up a pawn, b2 is weak, and I have sufficient counterplay. Um, and, you know, I say that because, you know, I was the one who was statically worse and, you know, I still have to prove myself dynamically better, but okay, already I can start looking at moves just like bishop to e6, knight e7. I have the center under control. It's going to take white some time to regain this pawn. And standard same as ideas of like knight to c1 followed by bishop c4 are going to take some time. So, okay, knight g2 wouldn't be possible in this position. Um, you know, curiously enough for me, the tournament before this, I had, uh, or not tournament, it was more of like a friendly game. Uh, that was rated. My opponent had played queen to e3, which is also on that same blog post, but um, one of the things that he found in that game was already after e5, the, the game becomes quite uncomfortable. Um, because already, you know, white's queen is exposed, and without this dark squared bishop, again, this queen is unprotected, maintaining that even though the queen is on e3, the, the dark squares are still very weak. So, 
you know, if white starts to look for other ways to kind of change the structure, okay, well, he could play queen to d2, which is what he ultimately, you know, decided on. But already after a move like d5, I feel like white's already conceding a lot here. Already I could just take, and I would say that, you know, black is very comfortable here. Again, the dark squares are weak. This knight can go to d7, and then maybe to c5 or to e5. Um, this bishop can go to b7, can go to d7, or if I wanted to be ambitious, play a5, b4, bishop to a6, and trade off the light squared bishops. Um, thus developing my knight to a6 and going to c5. I have options, and it's not quite clear why not being able to castle is a disadvantage yet. As long as I don't allow this push e5, I should be okay. So, already, you know, in this position, I feel like white's conceded, you know, a little bit, and of course, this is not a desirable position. It's an IQP with a hyperextended d-pawn. The b-pawn's already weak. I think I can just go ahead and pick this up, and tactically, I'm not conceding anything. So, that kind of forced White's hand a little bit, and he chose the move queen to d2, with the idea that he's holding all of his dark squares. But even though my opponent, you know, seems to have maintained the structure, it's not quite clear if he's maintained his static advantage. Um, already, my opponent has had to, you know, play one, two, three moves with this queen, and we're on move ten, and now our developmental advantages are the same. So already, my opponent has had to concede something in the sense that. You know, development is no longer in his favor. The only thing that's different is, you know, the ability to contest the center. And here I found a really nice resource, and I was really proud of finding, which is this idea of e5. And I'm really just asking, I'm asking, you know, White to kind of resolve the position. You know, if he takes, you know, we we've reached a Morozzi bind like position where, you know, White is stuck with the bad light squared bishop. He's already traded off the dark squared bishop, and this d5 square is not accessible to him because of the c6 pawn. So if he were to ever take on b5, I'll just take with the a pawn. I'm castling, playing rook to d8, putting a piece on d4. It should be a strategically nice game for black, maybe not a guaranteed win, but it's definitely black who will be the one pressing. So d takes e5 would not, you know, not be advisable. I, I definitely wouldn't expect it from a 2200 rated player. You know, if he, if he holds in the center, okay, we still have a standard King's Indian-like position. And it's not quite clear who he would do so, by the way. If he plays a move like Knight to GE2, I can already start thinking about taking. Although I would probably choose to castle first. Uh, I, you know, I need some time to think about it, but I think the point is that black is fine in this position. And I don't think he really wants to queenside castle in this position, because already th these two files are going to open up at some point in the future. And if the C file ever opens, you really don't want your king on C1 on the half open file or the open file. And I think rook to D1 would also be a concession of sorts because you still haven't resolved the problem with the king. And okay, like I'm not going to ever open up. I'm not. I'm never going to take on D4 if it means that I'm going to have this weak D6 pawn. So you know, good luck. I, I'm just going to have you stare at a battery. So I feel like all of these are concessions of sorts. Um, my opponent ultimately played the most challenging move, which was C5. I don't really think D5 is really that strong. Um, you know, for example, you know, I can just wait if I really wanted to and then take on C6 with the queen. Um, or if I really wanted to make the game interesting, maybe I could look at a move like C5, the idea being that it's like a Benko-like sacrifice, where white gets a pawn, but I'm staring at both the A and B pawns. I'll play a move like Bishop D7. A4 is already kind of dubious because, you know, he's a little bit weak and I'm going to play a move like knight to a6, knight to b4, and I think that that's sufficient counterplay for the pawn. And obviously, if he took with the a pawn, the rook on a1 is hanging. Another disadvantage of having not been able to develop over on the king side. And if he were to take, I've completed development, whereas my opponent has not. I have a lot of counterplay now on these two pawns, and I have a really strong center, so I'll castle. I'll be able to play rook to b8 if I wanted to, or I could play knight to e8 and f5. And I think I can easily play on both sides of the board. I'm not going to say that black is better. I am going to say, though, that black has enough counterplay to hope for a good game. Um, so I thought that this was you know, a reasonable option for black. But I like my opponent's choice, which was this move c5, because this is the most testing. And I think if, I think if black makes a single mistake in the next three moves, the game could easily be over. So in this position... After c5, it's you know it's already very difficult to come up with ideas, you know, for for black in this position, uh, and I I think I spent about ten minutes making sure that I had everything right. The of course the idea is that if I ever let white take on d6, c takes d6, my center just collapses, and a trade of the d and e pawns, I have no more central pawns 
And even though I control the d5 square, white will have very nice control over the d5 file, uh, not the d5, the, d, the d file, while I still have very little development. And it's quite clear that the static advantage will have, you know, changed hands again to white. And, you know, that's not exactly what I wanted, having set out with this opening. And so, you know, I thought for a little bit more. And, you know, my opponent played dynamically here. If I don't play dynamically, I lose a static edge. I need to look for dynamic options. So I don't really have many choices. There's just d takes c5, or I retreat my queen to like a7. And if I retreat my queen to a7, um, the idea, of course, being that if you were to take, which I think is a mistake, um, because e takes d4, then I'm probably better. I'll just play a move like c5, develop my knight. This pawn on d6 will fall on its own. So that was the idea with queen to a7. But of course, he doesn't have to take uh, on d6. He could take on e5 first, and when I move my knight, he'll play c6, d6, and I can almost resign already. So they really only meant I had one option, which was this move, d takes c5. And of course, if my opponent were to take this way, we've reached the position with the bind that we discussed earlier, and already I'm statically better. There's nothing to really worry about here. Um, so this wasn't of a concern. So really, you know, white has to resolve the structure. He can't defend it, because he doesn't have a pawn to defend the d4 pawn with. So there's really just d5 and uh, e5. I think e5, which is what my opponent played, is again probably the right decision, although it didn't end well for white. But already, for example, after move like d5, I think I could just start looking at moves like b4 at some point, uh, although I have to be careful about knight a4 ideas, or I can just take. Um, but then again, like, you know, we've reached this kind of weird bind position where the dark squares are weak. I can also just castle. Um, the idea being that if he plays d6, I now have ability to develop my light squared bishop. This pawn isn't really going anywhere after knight bd7, and I think it'll be more of a target, um, especially if I can get a, a knight onto d4. Or, you know, I think the easier plan that I'd come up with during the game, not during post analysis, is like let's let's say like just white plays. Um, you know, white probably wants to develop the bishop, so um, he can get castled. And the idea being knight h3, um, knight to f2 at the right moment. My idea was c4 and then bring the queen to d4, either go back and take, or allow a trade on d4, which would block the file and then take the pawn. That would be another way, I think, to secure the advantage. So I think I think black is okay here. So my opponent took on e5, threatening the knight. Okay, well, I don't really have that many options. He's going to play queen to d6, probably. So I played this move knight on f to d7. And I thought that this was the best way to kind of secure the structure. I think if I play anything else... Uh, I, I really have to start worrying about, you know, pawn pushes like e6 and, you know, the open d-file becomes an issue. For example, like, let's say I just play knight to h5. Let's ignore the fact that this is also probably completely acceptable. If white just queenside castles already, queen to d8 is annoying, and, you know, my queen, you know, is stuck protecting the d8 square. And if I castle, my opponent can already think about coming and then playing g4. So I'm not too thrilled about this option. So that's why I chose knight, to, knight on f to d7. My opponent played queen d6, and he has one obvious threat. And if I let him get away with this, again, dynamically, I'm going to be statically worse if he plays this move e6. So, you know, when, when I'm in a position like this and I'm trying to look for ways to exploit my opponent's position, there's been one critical theme throughout this, you know, first 13 moves, which is the idea that um, that white's dark squares are extremely weak. And if I don't attack white's dark squares, there's just no way I'm going to get the, the counterplay, the counterplay that I need. So, in this position... Uh, I decided to, it was time to play c4. And I really started to like my position, and already it was my opponent who was starting to spend more time than me. And the idea, of course, is that I'm threatening this move queen to e3. And unfortunately for my opponent, this idea of d5, while it was very aggressive, and I applaud my opponent for going down this road, it means that a move like queen to d2 is no longer possible because of knight takes e5. And then that'll leave the d3 square weak. The c4 move also, you know, it gets all of my pawns on the same color square as my opponent's bishop, so right now that'll be advantageous for me. Um, although it means I have a bad bishop, you know, my opponent's bishop isn't that great either because his critical pawns are all in light squares as well. You know, if my opponent, you know, tries to, you know, play slow moves like knight ge2, um, I believe I can already start looking at moves like knight to c5 with the idea of going to d3 with check or just stopping this idea of e6. I think in the game I wanted to put my bishop on e6. That way I could make sure that there was no, you know, e6 moves, and then castle, probably rook d8, and I'm completely fine. My opponent's struggling to get his king safe because of the um, the fact that the f1 bishop can't really go anywhere. Uh, it really can only go to e2. So I thought that this really caused him some problems. 
And I think here is where my opponent really handed me the static advantage. I think at this point, you know, maybe he's statically worse and he should be playing dynamically, but you're only supposed to play dynamically and if you can sustain it and if you can continue it until you get the static advantage. And when my opponent played this move e6, you know, as a forcing move intending to change the structure, because if I play f takes e6, you know, things start to get a little bit scary. Um, I think he may have missed, you know, my in-between move, which was this move queen to e3 check. And now it's it's not quite clear if, you know, if white actually gets what he wants because he has to, okay, block. He chose with the knight. If he chose, chooses with the bishop, the knight would have to go to h3, then f2. And I don't really think that this is a position that will allow him to have the time he needs to do this. Um, so he plays knight g2. And again, it would be really easy to play a move like f takes e6, queen takes e6, but then I, I really think I'm not, you know, giving myself the best possibility. Not to mention I've got a b8 knight that's tied to c6. You know, this knight, you know, he's going to want to move at some point. If I play king to d8 ever, he'll just play rook to d1 and he's winning. And I think if I play king to f8, he can also bring the queen here and enjoy a reasonable, comfortable position or just take a three-move repetition. I think if I were white, I would probably already do this. So f takes e6 will probably be a draw. So again, the theme is dark squares and dark squared, you know, weaknesses. In this case, without a dark squared bishop, my queen will be here on e3 for a very long time. My next move, however, my opponent is in a lot of trouble. Because now with this idea of knight to c5, this idea of knight to d3 check is, you know, virtually game over. After king d1, I have ideas like knight to f2, and I'm picking up a rook. Um, not to mention the d-file is open, and if his king is on d1, it'll be my king that might be more ready to make way for my, my rook to go to d8. So my my opponent realized this and realized that the only way to you know to save himself here was to get rid of the the queens and get them off the board, and even though that might have taken away a piece that could directly attack dark squares um, off the board, I think it also made his dark squares weaker because it, you know by taking away one of my dark squared attackers, he also removes one of his dark squared defenders. So after e f seven, king f seven, queen c four takes takes. In this position, it's really important to kind of assess what what what's happened you know it'd be really easy to say like okay white has more active pieces has a better structure has a central pawn um has quicker access to the h file but i think that would be the wrong way of assessing this position if we really look at the position i have a four versus two on the king side okay i have doubled pawns my opponent also has a four versus two so black does need a sense of urgency here if he lets white start pushing these pawns get this bishop active okay maybe white is better but we have to think of the now and of course if black can develop you know this knight on c5 is never going anywhere and that was the one real defining you know highlight i think of this position is that you know white really doesn't have any resources his bishop right now cannot really you know go beyond d3 because of the c4 pawn and this knight even though it looks really nice on f4 it doesn't really have options it can really just go to you know h3 and e2. So naturally, I thought, okay, g5 would be a good option because he doesn't want to go back because that would make knight d3 possible. Knight to h3 would allow me to trade off my bad bishop, so he has to play knight to h5. And now that knight to h5 has been played, now I thought it was the time to play rook to d8 because now my opponent has a really bad knight and it's not quite clear how he wants to contest the file. For example, if he plays rook to d1, um, he's already making a concession by, I think, trading this piece because he still has to develop. I'll get to the, I'll get to the position faster. And one of the main ideas that I had was that by playing g5 first, let's say he takes with king, so the knight stays active, is I could play this move bishop to e6, and there's no knight takes e6 ideas. I thought that this was a really important tempo um, because I thought I, I would need this light squared bishop to make sure all my light squares are secure. Then I'll play knight d7, knight b6, or knight d7, knight e5, followed by knight to d3, and I'll keep a knight on d3 until I play rook d8 and then move it out of the way. So, you know, this was my idea. So I already thought, you know, white strategically cannot contest the file. This file is mine. Instead, he makes an absolutely terrible mistake, which is this move g4. Um, and this was the move that solidified uh, a strategic advantage to a strategically winning position, I think. Even though that there's a long way to go, and this game you know, ultimately took a lot more moves, already my opponent has given me another weak dark square, which is this f4 square. And I understand that his idea is to play knight, g, knight on h5 to g3 to f5. But at that point, that knight will be strong enough that I'll just play bishop takes f5 anyways. He'll have doubled pawns. 
he'll also no longer have a structural advantage. This move also puts another, it moves the light square pawn on g2 to a further advanced light square. So he's actually more boxed than his f1 bishop. There's no idea of, like, if he had played g3, maybe he could hold out on the hope that he could play h4 and bishop to h3, trying to trade off the light squared bishops. Now there's just no option. So I wasn't really, you know, impressed with my opponent's decision here. And this, unfortunately for him, gives me another tempo to now get a, an advantage in development. And you know, if you've read Gelfand's positional book, Positional Decision Making in Chess, he kind of classifies development as a dynamic advantage, which in this game it certainly has developed for that reason. I also think it's a static advantage too, because if you look at like where my pieces are placed versus where my opponent's pieces are placed, it's very clear that I have long-term advantages in development. For example, my knight on c5 will never get kicked, and any any attempt for my opponent to do so would just weaken his queenside structure and make it easier for me to push my queenside pawn majority. So... I already thought that this was a little bit, you know, off kilter for my opponent. Um, what moves were I looking at here? Well, I thought maybe h4 would give my opponents reasonable playing chances. And one of the things that I'd come up with here was maybe to play this move g4. Uh, but I wasn't so sure. I remember I hadn't decided this yet because my opponent still has this idea of f4 and he's starting to get a little bit of space. But I can also just play h6. And this was my this was the move that I was definitely most comfortable with when I was at the board because, you know, I, I, I played my moves rook d8 knowing that if he played h4 I would at least have h6 and okay my opponent can get this h file but he in order to get the h file he would need, you know, to move the knight which would, you know, cost a pretty critical tempo and I'm getting ready to develop. You know, there's really no venom behind rook to h7 check, it's just a check um, and he hasn't really, you know, accomplished anything there. So I was relatively pleased here. I still have the I maintain the idea of g4, which is why I was unsure about playing g4 immediately, is because you know now by having waited, I I keep that option, and you know even if my opponent can try to win, like let's say I just give my opponent this pawn on c6. Um, well, here maybe it was a little bit too advantageous, but um, for example, maybe I could even play knight d7 first or bishop d7. Um, King g7 would also work because knight to f5, bishop takes, pawn takes, and this is not a stronger structure for black. This would probably be the best way to play, actually. Uh, but the idea is that I'm not that worried about my structural weaknesses. As long as I avoid allowing my opponent to have any counterplay, I should be okay. But okay, he didn't play h4, so I didn't really spend that much time you know, really worrying about it. I knew that at minimum h6... I'd be fine, and yeah, I think this was my analysis was to play king to g7 because I knew my opponent would have to move the knight. That was that was the critical idea. So he plays g4, which is definitely a positional concession, and I played this move bishop to e6. Um, the idea being that I'm simply just developing my piece. I'm preparing to play knight to d7 without blocking the bishop, and I'm going to go to e5. From e5, I'll have a pleasant choice between going to d3 or going to g6 and then f4. Going to g6 would also stop my opponent from playing h4 which I think is, you know, rather, you know, a pleasant option. Um, and so here my opponent played h4, I played h6. Again, I'm not worried about the h file. He plays this move knight to g3 with the idea of going to f5, but I already dismissed this because I knew that if he goes to f5, I'll just take it. So knight bd7, knight f5. This is a mistake because after bishop takes f5, g takes f5, he's created even more dark squared weaknesses because now e5 is even weaker. f4 will never be possible. Granted, if he had played e takes f5, it would have been much worse. Um, I already think I can just decide that I want to put my rook on e8. If he goes to f2, I can put my other rook on d8, or I can just play knight to e5. This is just bust um, for white. So he had to play g takes f5. And here, I, I definitely felt my advantage grew. Um, you know, one of the things that you have to think about with, you know, playing positionally and strategically is you can only win if your opponent makes mistakes, and they have to make enough of them for you to really be able to break through. One mistake, you know, of a slight positional degree might not be enough to win the game, and here my opponents made enough mistakes that I think I just have a better knight versus bishop position. So my opponent played, I mean, I played knight to e5, and my opponent played king to e2, and, you know, I have to think about how I want to improve my position. I could have very easily here, I think, played the move knight to d3 with the idea of going to f4 and been totally fine. But I had a slightly better idea, I think, which was to just limit my opponent's overall counterplay with this move b4. And so my thought was, when I played b4, my opponent has to go to d1, and now with all those pieces on the back rank, I just have a complete dominating advantage. So here I just played the move g4, and my idea is to kind of fix this pawn structure. 
I think either either choice, you know, letting me take on f3, which would lose a pawn, taking on g4 or playing f4, they all have their own, you know, weaknesses. My opponent went for f4, but if he took on g4, you know, the thought might be, oh, well, my opponent has two pass pawns, he has some counterplay, but, you know, I'm always going to have this blockade of playing knight to e5, and, you know, the e-file is now half open, you know, and the g-file is also open. My opponent's not really in a position to take advantage of these things. If he plays knight to e3, I can just play knight to e5, and my c5 knight will go to d3, attack b2, and even though my opponent has passed pawns, you know, when I play here, and my opponent plays b3, I'll play c3, and it's my passed pawn that's much more important. So, my opponent played f4, and I played knight to f3, which was the concession of having played f4, which is, you know, essentially now, you know, my opponent really doesn't have any options. And here my opponent played king to e3, and... Here, I had a little bit of a think, and then I had kind of had like an epiphany about the position. Um, and I think it's really easy um, to have these kinds of moments in games, because, you know, it looks like black just made a major concession by allowing bishop to c4. And, you know, I think with knight d3, black, black is fine, um, but white has this resource b3, and it can be kind of annoying, and trying to find a way around it isn't necessarily, you know, the, the nicest way of going about doing things. So in this position, I, I realized just by taking a step back that I could find a nice tactical resource. So I encourage you guys to pause the video and try to find it. Um, it's, I, I'd like to think it's not too difficult. So if you haven't found it yet, pause the video. But the idea here was that if I play this move and I take c4, if my opponent takes, this is actually a really nice checkmate. Um, and it's not so obvious to see at the board. Actually, my opponent, about three minutes in, you know, had like this exasperated gasp, like, oh, like, I can't do this. This is why I can't take the knight. And, you know, it's it's just, you know, interesting to see because you just don't usually see positions of this construction. So obviously, the knight, the knight is off limits. If my opponent does nothing about it, you know, I, I'm, I'm doing great. I've eliminated all resources for opponent counterplay now with these passed pawns. So he had to play bishop takes c4. And I played this move king to f6. And this works because if my opponent takes a knight... It's not that I have this check anymore, it's that I have this check, and I'll pick up the bishop. And even though the bishop was bad a couple moves ago, now it's actually okay. But my knight is so much better than his knight, I have so much more activity. These pawns are meaningless. In fact, I would say that my g-pawn is a bigger threat than either one of his f-pawns. Um, and I'm eventually going to have passers on both sides of the board. Um, you know, I have five pawns, my opponent has five pawns, but when I win this f5 pawn, I think black strategy here would be to trade off both pairs of rooks, because then we'll reach a knight endgame where I have either a pawn majority on one side or a pass pawn on another side of the board. It'll be too much for my opponent's knight. One thing to know about knight end games is they're a lot like pawn end games, and they can, they're, they're rather forced. And so when you're up a pawn going into a knight end game and your opponent doesn't have any clear forms of counterplay, you should just trust the fact that you probably have a win uh, and calculate something, some line. So this, this would not be possible. Um, so my opponent played bishop to e2, and here I had a, a nice line calculated out. Knight g3 takes, knight f5 check, king f2, g f3 now. Um, the reason why I inserted the Zwischen Zug is obviously if I take on f3, then when my opponent's king takes, this isn't check, so he has time to play a move like rook to e1, which is already kind of annoying. So that's why it was important to insert this move, because my opponent has to waste a tempo. And I played rook to d3 check, king to f2. Rook to d2, it was important to get on the second rank. If my opponent plays king to f3, he's kind of already walking into a mating net, and I think I have a nice idea of rook to g8 followed by rook to g3 and checkmate. So my opponent played king to e1, and now I played this move rook on a to d8. And now I really like my position because I have this idea of playing knight to g3, uh, followed by rook to e2, you know, and it's a checkmate. Furthermore, you know, my opponent now has to defend his knight, you know, if you play, you know, or play knight to f2, but if he plays knight to f2, then I have this, like, again, this fork between the h1 rook and the the e2 square. So my opponent played rook to h3, stopping knight g3 immediately, but what he didn't realize was that actually this move does nothing. So after rook to g2, he has no way now of stopping this move knight to g3. And it's just an advantage that you have from, you know, a, a just a general, you know, positional domination. You know, my opponent has no development, I have time. You know, to find tactics like this. My opponent played a3, but okay, this this does nothing. He took on a4 and b4. Now I played rook g1, king e2, rook e8, 
king d2, and I decided here it was time to just go ahead and pin the knight. And so here in this position, rook to c1, you know, we had just made second time control, it's move 42. And, you know, you really have to start thinking here, you know, I have two rooks, my opponent has a rook and knight. There are some times where rook and knight versus rook and rook are drawn. And here I have one fewer pawn than my opponent, and he's immediately threatening rook to c6 with check. It's not so easy to try to come up with something here, uh, admittedly. You know, already, you know, yeah, maybe this pin, you know, should be enough to win the game, but, you know, if I play king to c5, my opponent just, you know, he checks and he gets to relieve the pin, so my king actually has to go backwards. My king can't actually make progress. None of these pawns are actual threats for pass pawns. And if I ever move my rook off the back rank, I relieve the pin. It's not so clear to win. So here I use a nice idea called simplification. And if you can calculate out a win from a simplified position, then you know you're golden. So rook takes d1, rook takes d1, rook takes d1, king takes d1, and here I have a one pawn end game because my h pawn is going to be able to go faster than my opponent's. You know, well let's just say his pass pawn because he'll promote on if he promotes a b8. You know, he'll promote with the B, B2 pawn as well, but, you know, obviously if I beat him, then it won't matter either way. My opponent played king to d2, and the, one of the reasons I knew this position would be winning is not only does my opponent have to take the c6 pawn, he has to also take the a6 pawn, which will be more than enough time for me to promote. Um, king to d3. In the game, I was a little bit worried maybe my opponent would go for king to e2 um, and go for a line like this where he tries to close me in, but then after a move like a5, he has to concede something. And if he goes here, I can go back. And he can try to win this a5 pawn, but now I'm the one who's going to win on the queen side, ironically. So there's no way my opponent has enough time, and I just start marching up the board. He can't, you know, push, and now I go here. And eventually I'll just sack one of the pawns and push the other one, and I'll have enough time. So by sacking on the third rank, my opponent will have enough time to promote his pawn to a queen. So, you know, this is not really a possible defense, although I thought it might have been, you know, maybe... The, the most annoying, but okay, he put king d2, and now I just go queen my pawn, and we reach this new endgame, knight pawn versus king. Now, if this was a bishop pawn, this this would actually you know be dangerously close to a draw, because with the bishop pawn, if I ever take on c2 and his king's on a8, you know, it's going to be a stalemate, because the queen will control both the b8 and the a7 squares from c7 and we'll have a quality. However, with it being doubled pawns, it's harder to have a lot of these stalemating ideas. So, in this kind of a position, I thought it was really important to get my queen on like the right diagonal. So I played queen c6, king a7, queen to c7. And my idea is that if he plays king to a8, you know, I'll check him, he puts his king on b8, I move my king closer. This is a very common mechanism with queen versus one pawn. But with queen versus two pawns, he doesn't have to move his king. He can move the b4 pawn. Let me also point out that one of the, my ideas is that if he ever moves his king away from a7 or a8, I'm going to play queen to b8. So b4 was more or less forced. Maybe b3 would have been the better way of doing things, but he played b4 with the idea of stopping queen to a5. Okay. So I get to bring my king a step closer anyways. My opponent didn't really do anything with his last move. He's still pinned. So now he plays this move king to a8, and it's important to make sure that you know I don't give up. Yeah, I don't give up my advantage. You know, obviously he's threatening the queen. If I play queen d8, he'll queen. I don't have queen to a5, so I have to pin. He plays b5. Okay, if I take his pawn, he'll queen. So now, you know, I calculated out which which square I wanted to go to, and I thought it was important to kind of figure out how to win from here. And I decided that I wanted to go to f3 to be able to have scope to go to f8 if I needed to. Um, for example, king a7, queen a3 check, king b6, queen d6. I think somebody else pointed out later that I could have gone into f8 and it would have been a couple of moves faster. But in endgame, it's just important that you just win. King a7, queen c7. And this was the idea. Uh, I just wanted to create, you know, I wanted to create the similar mechanism to what I had had in this position. But I wanted him to be able to move the pawn forward. So what I did was when I pinned here and he pushed here, obviously if I play queen c7, I'm not, you know, I'm not in time. So what I did was I rerouted my queen so I can get to this position. So we just got the, the position I wanted, but it's white's turn and it, he doesn't have the ability to play b8 so he plays b6 okay so you're playing queen d7 so if he plays king to a8 i'm going to check him but if he plays king b8 i'm going to bring in my king so he he's in zugzwang uh if he plays king to a6 it's checkmate actually 
because of the second pawn. So this would have been an unfortunate mistake. So he chose king to a8. Queen to a4 check, king to b8, and I bring in my king again, king c7. But now that my king is close enough, I actually can use my king now as a way to protect my queen. So queen c4, king c8, queen f8, king c7, queen d8, and my opponent resigned in light of the fact that after king to c6, I'm going to play this move, and he has to start giving up his pawns. So I thought that this was a really exciting game. Um, you know, it seemed like it was really back and forth, but if you really think about it, black was actually in control from the moment white played e6 and tried to do too much with the position. Um, you know, I don't really know of that many places where white could have done that much better. I mean, he made some mistakes, obviously, like he could have played h4 instead of g4, but... You know, in reality, you know, my opponent, you know, was already strategically worse. And it was just a matter of finding the conversion and taking advantage of the dark squares. You know, I didn't really, you know, I don't really think of the same-ish opening so much as like a dark squared opening. But when you trade off the dark squared bishops, it really kind of gives it that element of white's dark squares are really weak. And that's kind of accentuated by the fact that, you know, the f3 pawn blocks the knight from going in and it creates a weak f2 and e3 square, while at the same time, it slows white's development to the point where it's really difficult to control dark squares and develop and keep your king safe. And that was really the lesson from this game. You know, unfortunately for my opponent, you know, he was a higher rated player than me. He didn't really have a chance after the opening. Um, and, I, you know, I'm not going to say that, you know, all of this had been preparation on my part. Uh, in fact, I wasn't expecting this bishop h6 move at all. I had only played against it once before. Um, but... You know, if you just think about what your opponent's weaknesses are and try to exploit them dynamically in positions where you're statically worse, sometimes sometimes you'll come out okay. So I hope you enjoyed this video. This is Isaac Steinkamp signing off for the Chess Summit Network.